Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Kopano, for the introduction and for the invitation. And thank you to Nisizwa as well. Um, is this on? Loud enough? Yes? OK. Uh, so my talk here today, um, apologies for the title. It's, it's like a newspaper article kind of thing. <laughs> But in my rush to get the title to Nessie's way, that's what it is. Um, but the work I'm presenting today is, is a project I've been working on um, uh, for the past while. So it's kind of work in progress. Um, and it's around, it's archival work and it's kind of uh, rereading uh, sexual violence and, um, uh, and the role of women in slavery. So I want to start this presentation with a, a short vignette um, around a case from 2004 involving a woman called Cynthia Jorney. On the 2nd of October 2014, 44-year-old Cynthia Jorney stepped off the train. She had just traveled the approximately 30 kilometers from her home in Kailicha to Kenilworth, the leafy southern suburb that some of us will be familiar with. Um, where she was employed as a domestic worker. While walking from the station to the home of her employer, she noticed a man, a white man she didn't know. He pulled up and stopped his car in the street. Without speaking, he got out of the car, walked across uh, towards her, and proceeded to physically assault her. She reported that he slapped her in the face and kicked her until she fell down. He continued hitting her, after which, again, without uttering any words, he walked back to his car and left the scene. Johnny was assisted by someone who had witnessed the incident and who also took down the car registration number. We later discovered that Johnny's attacker, Tim Osrin, was a resident of Upper Kenilworth and a swimming school owner who operated in the southern suburbs of Cape Town. It is also revealed that Osrin had earlier physically and sexually assaulted another woman who worked as a sex worker in the area. When asked to account for his attack against Johnny, Osrin had this to say, and I quote, I thought she was a prostitute. She was walking in the street at 10 to 10 in the morning. I told her to get out of my street, and she laughed. And I thought she was giving me the finger again. For four years, these prostitutes have been giving us the finger. End quote. Sorry, not end quote. He also says, I just want people to know the truth, where I was coming from and what led to the emotional meltdown. It was not a racist or gender thing, of course. Nothing like that. I just snapped. It is a result of the years of stress of having these people, these people in our area, in our area. End quote. So, Despite the fact of Tim Osrin acting out his historical and continuing entitlement to the space, the leafy suburb of Kenilworth, um, and he acts out his, his historical and continuing entitlement on the body of Cynthia Jorney, um, and despite our everyday encounters with the violences of privileged white men and women, we continue to see gendered and sexual violence through very particular lenses. And so, uh, knowledge production uh, on gendered and sexual violence, we see, and this is prevalent in academic discourse, um, as through the lens of social pathology, uh, which involves discussions about broken families, about absent fathers, drug and alcohol abuse, gangs, crime, poverty, unemployment. Okay, so a kind of social pathology. Um, Often also, when we talk about gendered and sexual violence, um, we talk about apartheid. There's a broad sweep, right? It's, all of this stems from apartheid. Um, so I'm arguing that this, our reading is largely ahistorical because it, it's a, as if our story begins with apartheid, which it doesn't. Um, but this reading around social pathology also manufactures a narrative of violence um, as the exclusive domain of black men, uh, mainly poor black men, and also located in black communities. Um, and we see this apparent in academic discourse, 
in lay discourse as well as in media discourse on gendered and sexual violence. Okay. So I'm arguing that we need to rethink our framing of gendered and sexual violence against women. And to do this, uh, what I'm arguing in this, in this presentation, is we need to resurrect histories that have been erased, that have been uh, and that have been obscured. And, I, and I'm suggesting that we need to open up a discursive space for new ways of thinking about violence and for interrogating why it persists, why, why in South Africa we have the highest rates of gendered and sexual violence against women. What I'm also doing is um, I'm interweaving my, my, my story here, my narrative here, with um, um, some images from a visual artist, American visual artist called Nona Fustine, and her, the series of, uh, it, she produces called White Shoes. Um, and she took a number of photographs. Um, she presents herself naked in a number of landscapes in New York City to rememorialize slavery, the history of slavery, particularly in sites that are, that, that are not marked as signifying that history. And so here, this image is called uh, Like a Pregnant Corpse, the Ship Expelled Her into the Patriarchy from 2012, and it's taken at the Atlantic Coast in Brooklyn. So I'm arguing that we need to rethink our framing of gendered and sexual violence against women. We need to resurrect the histories that have been erased or obscured and to open up a new way for thinking. Sorry, I've said that already. And I think we need to address um, some silences. Um, we find that there's an absence of popular memory in our context on slavery. What Paula um, ascribes to the power of shame, I'll come back to this question of shame, the power of shame associated with the past and the success of 340 years of white supremacism and its physical and epistemic violences to suppress other histories, stories, and memories. So we see the silencing of talk around slavery. Um, and there's also, in, in the historical record, in historical work, there's also a silencing of the experiences of women. Uh, particularly enslaved women and indigenous women. Um, the, we also see a silencing of the ways in which sexual violence was central to the system of slavery. So in historical work that talks about slavery, there's very little mention of, um, of, um, of sexual violence, yet we know it was embedded in the system of slavery, encoded in the name given to enslaved people born at the Cape, the surname given, Fund and Calf. Okay, so, so there's this huge silencing of that experience too. I'm arguing that decolonizing our thinking about gendered violence involves working through the regimes of images of Africa and African people that was integral to white super supremacy and the subjugation and enslavement of those deemed other. It involves working with the gendered, sexual, and racialized essentialisms that were embedded in colonialism and the enslavement of those who were deemed other. I'm interested in thinking through how we might stitch the narrative of slavery with its symbolic and material violences back into our contemporary framings of gendered and sexual violence. So I didn't, I didn't say why I think um, Faustine's, um, the series is so powerful. I think she powerfully, yeah, um, she provides commentary on space, on race, on gender, and she uses her body to highlight uh, the vulnerability of, of the black female body in particular, but she also reads herself in relation to, she reads herself and her experience as a black woman in America in relation to historical uh, black women um, during, during the time of slavery. And very powerfully, I think, which is relevant for what I'm talking about, I think she provides some kind of commentary on the ghosts that, that, that remain in the contemporary moment. 
<clears throat> so what I'm going to be doing next is to provide some case studies or examples from my engagement with archival material uh, in trying to, uh, to resurrect some kind of history or some the, to reread the archive and to bring to the fore some of what's been obscured or erased. And the first is, um, so the two historians, uh, Worden and, and Grunewald, produced a, a manuscript called The Trials of Slavery, um, and they transcribed a number of documents that had not quite been accessible to historians before from the criminal record. Um, and this manuscript is quite powerful in terms of what it shows or illustrates about the social, emotional lives of enslaved people, um, as well as the context of slavery itself. And so, so I've read this, and I've drawn out some examples that talk about, um, about violence. So the first case is um, uh, Anthony van, van Gowa, who was accused in 17... 1721 of violently attacking Yaniki, his wife. Although, as Kopana said earlier, slave marriages were illegal until 1823. Antoni had been separated from Yaniki through being sold and later returned to the farm to see that she had taken another partner. He violently attacked her by stabbing her in the abdomen. Following this, he attempted suicide. The details of Yannicki's injuries are described at length, as well as Antoine's motivations for the attack. From the record, however, we know nothing more of Yannicki, including whether or not she had survived the attack. Okay. Another example, it's the story of Michael Laurich, Michael Laurich, in 1740, who was accused of causing the death of his female slave, Diana. According to the testimony provided by another of his slaves, Yanyu Warifan Malabar, which he, wit uh, he witnessed Laurich's wife leave the home with her baby, after which Laurich, who had been drinking, searched for the slave Diana. Upon finding her, he dragged her by the hair into the kitchen, where he ordered Yanyu Wari to beat her with the sambok. The beating continued for a while with Diana running away twice, attempting to request help from a lodger who was sleeping in the front room of the house. Lauri, who ignored the brief intervention by the lodger, later tore off Diana's clothing and, when the same was totally naked, tied her hands and feet together with the rope and then beat her with a sambok on her naked body, which lasted almost a whole hour. <coughs> Excuse me. After the beating, while she lay on the floor, Larry kicked her once or twice, muttering the words, Damn you, whore. These words and the indication that he had earlier had an argument with his wife provide some hint at Larry's motivation for beating Diana. Of course, he also beat her because he could. Diana died the next morning. Larry was banished from the Cape and sent back to the Netherlands as a useless subject. The, the third case, the last case I'm, I'm presenting here, is from 1749, um, where uh, Jan Latechan ordered the, the male slave, Yuli uh, van Bengalen, to whip uh, the female slave, Regina van Tenaten, for absenteeism. It follows a similar script to the previous one, where he began the ordered beating of Regina on her buttocks with a sambok. Latechan later continued the beating, sending Yuli back to work in the garden. Some days later, Regina van Tenaten's body was found in the felt. He was fined for his murder of Regina, a common penalty for slaveholders who had been found to use excessive forms of punishment. So these records tell a story about the multiple forms of symbolic and material violence that had been enacted on women's bodies. Importantly, they reveal the literal manifestations of violence. What we can discern as well is while the extent of women's injuries are described in some detail, we know very little else about them and their lives as enslaved women. In some cases, 
uh, we don't even know whether they lived or died as a result of the violence. These individual cases of violence are, represent, are represented in the archive as colonial discourse that represents women in the most dehumanizing ways, in ways that continue to reinscribe the knowing of black women through their bodies. Black women enter the archive as what Kola calls bodies of evidence, bodies that bear the marks of multiple violations. And I think it's something that Faustine, um, in this image, also comments on. She's, uh, it, it's taken at the cemetery, a, a Dutch pre-revolutionary pre cemetery in Brooklyn, where three slaves are buried among the early settlers, and it's called, Of My Body, I Will Make Monuments in Your Honor. Okay, so, so from reading the archive, it's... Um, and particularly looking at this question of sexual violence, um, there's, I guess the first question to ask in relation to the question of sexual violence is what does a consensual sexual relationship with owned property look like? And I think this question is important to ask because um, historians of slavery have overlooked the the embeddedness of sexual violence in the very system of slavery itself. Um, and you'll find, when you read historical works, some of these relationships have been described as just that, relationships that are consensual and that um, are, are undertaken as a result of free choice on the part of women to, um, to um, provide themselves with some kind of advantage. Okay, so, the, so this has been critiqued by uh, scholars like Kola and Khabeba Badarun who ask, like, you know, we need to think about this, this notion of free choice and, and, and how can you talk about consensual relationship when we are talking about the question of ownership of another human being. So there's, there's this huge silencing of sexual violence um, and there's also this notion that in order to to read sexual violence into um, the narrative, we need to look beyond the obvious. Okay, what Yvette Christiansa talks about is reading for the echoes and the silences and the traces that appear. Um, and she says, uh, the reading for the echoes and the silences may be the only sites of appearance for those nobodies who were in th who were in the in the service of somebody? Okay, so it's it's not it's not something you can automatically read off the archive, and uh, so 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 this is the way in which I approached the archive because there were um, in the first instance no settler, no uh, was a white man was ever convicted for the rape of a, an enslaved or indigenous woman. Okay. Um, and so the, 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 this is the way in which I approached the archive was to read beyond w w the obvious. Um, and so one of the um, documents I was reading was um, when the British occupied the, the Cape, uh, they instituted a, an office for the guardian of slaves. Right? And this guardian of slaves would hear complaints from slaves about the treatment um, they received from, the, from slaveholders. And so I read, engaged a bit with the, with the kinds of complaints that um, enslaved people would bring to the office of the guardian of slaves. And often, um, so in the first, in the one thing to remember as well there was that there was a huge um, sex imbalance. There were a lot more men um, than women. But what's striking about who appears at the guardian's office is that there were quite a number of complaints from women, enslaved women. And I read the, the way in which sexual violence was taken for granted um, through the kinds of complaints that women lodged with the guardian, right? It was about children who had been born by them and their freedom that had been promised by slave, their slave owners. Um, 
so that the sexual contact that they, they sometimes talk about or, or, or are inferring um, is not named as rape, but it's, it's a kind of taken for granted, right? It's not, it's not the reason they lodge the complaint. They're lodging the complaint because a slave master had promised freedom for the child, but had not granted the child that freedom. Um, so they appear there to use the system to claim the rights for their children not to be registered as slaves. <coughs> so I want to just provide an example here um, from, from the Book of Complaints. Um, on the 2nd of December, 1827, a female slave named Lasada appeared at the office of the Guardian of Slaves. She indicated that she had... She had had connection with her master, Jan David Jurgens of Cape Town, some time ago, and has a child named Regina. She also stated that she was um, being ill-treated by her master, who beat her continually, and that her master is a married man, but that his wife did not know anything about the connection. Because her master made a promise never to speak to anyone, about it. She asked for the guardian to prevent her child from being registered as a slave. Um, so the point I made earlier that the system is being used to assert their, their rights, but in relation to the rights of children, right, being born out of um, sexual coercion um, by the, the slaveholder. But at the same time, their very assertions of dignity also produces a situation in which the sexualized colonial script about the promiscuous sexuality of, uh, of black women are reproduced, right? Because this, 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 this complaint initiates a process in which now there has to be an investigation about whose child this is. And that reproduces um, 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 some, this, this colonial script about promiscuous sexuality. Um, another example appears uh, around rape, um, uh, appears in the, in the work of Pamela Scully. <coughs> and she talks about, uh, in 1850, the rape of Anna Simpson, who was raped by one Damon Boyson in the town of George. Boyson was accused of and confessed to the rape of Anna Simpson and was sentenced to death by Justice William Menzies. Boyson is described as likely a man of color given his name and those of his friends and family mentioned in the archive. A few months later, the judge wrote to the governor of the Cape, indicating that he had made a grave mistake in thinking that Anna Simpson was white. He had, subsequent to rendering his judgment, received a letter from respectable, and here you, you, you should read white, residents of George, indicating that she and her husband were bastard colored, is the term used to refer to the child of a slave father and coy mother, thereby calling her respectability into question. In another move that called Anna Simpson's respectability into question, the residents indicated that she had had prior voluntary connection with um, Damon Boyson. The judge subsequently commuted Boyson's sentence to a term of imprisonment and hard labor. So we can see here that notions of respectability, honor, status, imbued with colonial constructions of race, gender, and sexuality under slavery, work to reinforce whose bodies matters and who, uh, mattered and whose didn't, which violations mattered and which didn't. Um, these notions determined how a rape case was dealt with, such that evidence of a prior experience of a sexual relationship with the accused was sufficient to repeal a sentence. This evidence, alongside the construction of Simpson as sexually illicit, given her identification as already sexually illicit, given that she's a black woman, was used as evidence to discredit the sex her sexual honor and thereby her credibility as a victim. The rape of Anna Simpson and the ways in which it was read by those in authority has continuing relevance for us today, especially for contemporary narratives of rape in South Africa. Its representations of black and white femininity, respectability, and honor intersected with notions of culpability and credibility and rightful victim status are also relevant in the contemporary moment. <clears throat>
Um, given the ways in which the widespread sexual violation of women went unspoken, um, I think we have to also talk about issues of shame and how it is that the oppressed are the ones who frequently carry the shame for their own oppression. And um, Wickham talks, Zoe Wickham talks about ontological shame that results from accusations that black women were complicit with their own violations. 